So um, this is really more talk about castration-resistant prostate cancer. And again, these, are, these concepts are going to change as we move some of these other treatments up front and earlier. But in the past, the patient initially came in with a high disease burden with metastatic disease. They underwent androgen deprivation therapy. We knew that they lost bone mineral density. Uh, they had skeletal events from this particular issue. After about 18 to 24 months, on average, these patients became castrate resistant, and they developed other issues, skeletal-related events, metastases to the viscera. And um, we know that the definition of castrate-resistant disease is based upon a patient having a serum testosterone of less than 50. That's the most accepted guideline. There's some people who believe that a testosterone of less than 30 is what you really want, but in general, 50 is the minimum uh, or the maximum amount of testosterone you want to see in these patients. And the definition is you see an increasing PSA or an increase or a progression on bone scan imaging or CT scan imaging. It in the past has been called hormone refractory disease or androgen independent disease. Uh, I actually prefer endocrine resistant because a lot of patients feel that castrate resistant is a pejorative term and they really don't like to hear it. So why does this develop? You have a low, low serum testosterone level and the patient still can begin to have the, the tumor progress. Well, as some people say, there are a lot of different ways to roam, and there are a lot of different ways that you can develop resistance to the primary hormonal treatment. This can occur by mutations in the androgen receptor, aberrant modifications of the androgen receptor, alternative splicing. The androgen receptor is three different portions, the DNA binding regimen, uh, area, the uh, ligand binding area, and the hinge area, and some uh, uh, splices of the, or splice variants as we call them, the androgen receptor, don't have the ligand binding domain and they can become constitutively active and that can cause a major problem. And then there's something that was discovered a number of years ago by a guy by the name of Jack Geller and what he found was is that despite the fact that there may be castrate levels in the serum, the tumor cells actually have increased levels of androgen and this is due to intracrine androgen synthesis. These, all of these particular mechanisms can result in restoration of androgen uh, activity and a rising PSA and recurring tumor development. So again, as I said, there are a variety of different ways, and including amplification of the androgen receptor that you can get to that level. Now we're in the era of molecular targeting. And um, for lung cancer in particular, patient will come into a, an oncologist's office, the tumors will be phenotyped. You'll be looking for EGF mutations, you'll be looking for uh, different immune markers, and that era is going to come forth in prostate cancer. We're not quite there yet, but we will get there. And when we start looking at different oncogenes in prostate cancer, we see that the androgen receptor is, uh, is there in about a, nearly all metastases. In an oncogene pathway called P10, which also is involved with AKT and RAS, we see high levels of mutation in the metastatic disease. We also see about a third of the patients having a fusion protein called tempers 2 ETS, which, may, uh, which we still haven't dr drugged yet. But these targets may become druggable in the future. P53 is mutated in about half of patients. As I mentioned before, P10, there are drugs that are now being used to evaluate P10 in the situation. And I think right now the most exciting area where we, we actually can make a therapeutic difference is in DNA repair genes. About a third of patients with prostate cancer uh, and castrate resistance have mutations in BRCA or ATM, and this is a druggable target. We'll talk about that at the end. So we are developing different ways of, of phenotyping these patients. The big problem is, as opposed to a lung cancer patient who has a soft tissue biopsy that they can evaluate uh, oncogenes on, it's much more difficult in prostate cancer because we've got disease that's predominantly limited to the bone. So we're now developing these liquid biopsies to look at circulating tumor cells, look at plasma DNA, looking at uh, other soft tissue lesions, and also eventually, as, as we saw in the first talk, we're going to be developing imaging techniques to look at different molecular markers. And we're going to look at, right now, at least at some markers in terms of androgen deprivation therapy. I mentioned before that there's a splice variant uh, of the androgen receptor called ARV7. This does not, as I said, have the ligand binding domain, and that is associated with resistance to abiraterone or enzalutamide. 
makes sense because en en enzalutamide can't bind to that area, can't shut down that particular receptor. And if you don't have, no matter how low your testosterone levels are going to be, this will still um, uh, allow the cancer cells to grow. Now, uh, there are biomarker-driven trials under the way, and the interesting thing about ARV7 is that even though you may be resistant to enzalutamide or abiraterone, this does not mark for resistance to chemotherapy and may be a way that we can select our patients. And we'll get into more detail about BRCA in a little while, uh, but this is going to be an important uh, marker. So how do I like to, th to divvy up my treatment of castrate-resistant prostate cancer? I like to think in terms of mechanism. We have really four main mechanisms we can use for these patients. Immune therapy with uh, agents such as cipulosal T, other hormonal agents, which we've covered already, cytotoxic therapy with docetaxel or cabazitaxel, and then DNA damaging agents. And radium-223, which is an isotope, also fits in that particular category. There's only one drug that's approved by the FDA based upon what you've received, and that's cabazitaxel. It's only approved for patients who've received prior docetaxel. All these other drugs can be used at any point in the, in the, uh, the uh, castrate-resistant prostate cancer timeline. How do we sequence these agents? Symptomatic versus asymptomatic. I'm not going to want to give a patient who's got symptomatic bone metastasis, cipulosal T. Uh, I would want to give them chemotherapy or isotope therapy or hormone therapy. Visceral disease, we don't give immune therapy for that. We don't give isotope therapy for a patient with visceral disease. That's for bone-only disease. Pre and post docetaxel, well, that's one way of selecting cabazitaxel. And then we don't like to go forth with drugs that are cross-resistant. So let's first talk about immune therapy. This is one of the more controversial areas in, um, in prostate cancer. And in looking at other tumors, though, it's, it's not as difficult uh, to really see a difference with immune therapy. The, the, the parameters are different. In bladder cancer, in kidney cancer, we don't see differences in time to progression. And this was one of the major arguments with prostate cancer. We didn't see time to progression differences with cipulosal T. This is a uh, product that is taken from the patient's own lymphocytes. The lymphocytes are exposed to a fusion protein that has prostatic acid phosphatase and GMCSF. This is taken up by uh, the uh, lymphocytes, and then the patients develop these fully activated antigen-presenting cells, which can activate T cells and then proliferate and cause an anti-cancer effect. Now, there were three randomized trials done with cipulosal T, the one that uh, got uh, cipulosal T approved by the FDA was the IMPACT study. This was for patients who had non-visceral disease, bone only, or minimal lymph node disease. They couldn't be symptomatic. In other words, they could not require uh, uh, narcotic analgesics. And patients were randomized to receive either CYP-T or a placebo. And there was about a 22% reduction in the risk of death or a four-month absolute difference in the median survival in favor of CYP-T versus placebo. But what you didn't see was a PSA decline. You didn't see objective tumor responses. And so a lot of people were extremely skeptical about this initially. Well, th there are some reasons for this happening. And, and again, the curves don't separate early. They separate late. But also, when you start looking at different parameters in terms of CYP-T, in terms of volume of disease, the patients with the lowest volume of disease seem to do best. And um, uh, there's a difference in the hazard ratios. Here it's 0.84 for PSAs of 134, 0.51 for those patients of a PSA of less than 22, and a 13-month difference in the median survival rather than the four-month difference for all patients. So uh, one may argue that this is just simply uh, moving it earlier in the course of disease, but there's a lot of evidence that using immune therapy earlier when the volume of disease is lower may actually give more of an impact. Now, that's really unfortunately where our effectiveness with immune therapy uh, uh, ends. We've looked at other agents, some of the checkpoint inhibitors. These are now the drugs that are the, the, all the rage at this point in lung cancer and melanoma. Ipilimumab, which is something that is a checkpoint inhibitor that inhibits a CTLA-4, which is a uh, marker on the immune cells, was evaluated in patients with metastatic prostate cancer who had failed docetaxel. So these patients receive one dose of, of radiation therapy to induce something called the abscopal effect, which is by causing a cytotoxic effect on one site, you're releasing antigens, and you're making the, the, the patients more exposed to or sensitive, potentially, to immune agent. And this was compared to placebo, 
in patients with uh, food failed docetaxel. There was no difference in overall survival for all comers, but the bone-only patients did have a survival benefit. And in fact, if this trial was designed for only patients with bone metastases, it would have been a positive study. What about the checkpoints? You see uh, uh, Keytruda being advertised on television for lung cancer. We've seen dramatic responses with, with Keytruda in patients or uh, uh, pembrolizumab, which is the uh, generic name, in patients with bladder cancer, about a third of patients to a quarter of patients will have these dramatic tumor shrinkages. What about prostate cancer? Well, <clears throat> we see a very varying pattern, and it's actually something we really need to understand better. Um, the, the target, the other checkpoint, PDL1, is expressed in about a half of hormone sensitive patients. It does seem to be upregulated in patients who've had prior enzalutamide. One of the checkpoints in the volumab was evaluated in men with castrate resistant disease. It didn't really show anything. But pembrolizumab does seem to show something. And this is a trial that was published by Julie Graff, where they looked at all comers who had failed enzalutamide. 19% of patients had a PSA decline and two patients who had extensive disease in liver had those liver lesions disappear. So there does seem to be some activity. This is the only drug that's approved by the FDA for all comers based upon a biomarker. Now, uh, there is something called microsatellite instability, which is the ability to repair DNA. It's seen in some of the familial cancer syndromes. Uh, one of these patients did have the microsatellite instability, the other one did not. But if a patient comes in with unusual metastases, as we've seen in our practice, we always check for the MSI marker because they can receive pembrolizumab based upon the FDA approval, and we've seen responses in prostate cancer with it. So we really need to understand why we're seeing this great response rate, we're seeing these dramatic responses, yet not a particularly high response rate overall, and I think, again, the jury's still out on immune therapy. And if you look, at, look at, at, at the tumor specimens from prostate cancer, where you'll see inflammation in bladder cancer, you really don't see that initially in prostate. I often joke that uh, if uh, the immune desert is where you don't see a lot of immune cells, prostate cancer is the Sahara with a bunch of oases that are, are, are peppered in between. So we may need a combination approach to really see a big difference in castrate-resistant disease. And uh, chemotherapy or radiation therapy may prime the cells, and we may need to combine this with vaccines. So onto hormones, we've already talked about abiraterone in the early setting. Uh, this is a drug that will inhibit the CYP17 enzyme that's required for androgen biosynthesis in testicular adrenal and prostatic tumor tissues. And um, this uh, pathway uh, is important because of one of the side effects that we see with this, or two of them, hypertension and hypokalemia. This is because you can develop a mineral, mineral corticoids that can uh, be from the CYP17 inhibition and uh, you have to monitor these patients for these three factors, including uh, fluid retention. Abiraterone will inhibit the conversion of pregnisolone uh, to 17-hydroxypregnisolone and then to androstenedione. And again, this is how we deplete intracellular androgens. In the castrate-resistant state, abiraterone has been evaluated in two different settings. In the first approval, this was in the post-chemotherapy setting after docetaxel. They were actually allowed to have received up to two prior chemotherapies. It didn't make a difference in the survival benefit whether they received one or two prior chemos. Uh, the absolute difference, again, is about four months, uh, and this is compared to a placebo plus prednisone. Uh, these are the side effects that we've talked about already, fluid retention, hypokalemia, cardiac disorders, hypertension, and uh, uh, liver function abnormalities. These all need to be monitored in our patients. When we give abiraterone before chemotherapy, we double the time to radiographic progression-free survival. We also still see a survival benefit. It's overall about four months. Look, look at these numbers, too. 30 months for the survival. Think about in 1990 when these patients were living one year we are making a difference in, in the overall outcome of the disease. Uh, but again, a small benefit, about four months overall. Enzalutamide works a little bit differently. This is an androgen receptor antagonist. Uh, it, uh, it does not have agonist activity. It will inhibit the binding of testosterone to the androgen receptor. It will block the activation and the translocation of the androgen receptor into the nucleus, and it also will block the binding of, of, of the androgen receptor complex to, to DNA. Several differences in the trials that got enzalutamide approved. 
Namely, you don't need prednisone with enzalutamide, so the control arm was a placebo, although about 10% of patients were on prednisone in this study. This was initially approved in the post-chemotherapy setting, showing about a 4.8-month difference uh, in uh, the median survival. Pre-chemotherapy, we see the same pattern that we saw with abiraterone, uh, 32 months versus 30 months in the survivals, doubling of the progression-free survival in terms of the radiographic PFS, so again, active when you give it beforehand. A different side effect pattern. Seizures in the original trials were seen in 0.9% of patients, 0.1% of patients prevail, and the most common problem I see with, with enzalutamide is fatigue. It's not the fatigue that you see with the other drugs. It's a fatigue that's, um, I can't function at work. I can't add a column of figures. I'm not as sharp mentally. Uh, and patients can have significant issues. You have to dose adjust these patients. If you see a patient that's elderly and frail, you really want to start low and then move up high. There's some people who have used Ritalin to try to overcome this. I'm not sure if that actually does anything. Uh, but you have to titrate the drug and, in fact, often dose reduce in the patient if they have these particular problems. What about sequencing? I alluded to this before. If you sequence these drugs, there's not a huge degree of activity in terms of PSA declines or median time to progression. It's generally about two to four months. So if you fail one, you're not going to get a great response out of the other, uh, or at least a prolonged response uh, afterwards. There are trials that are now combining enzalutamide plus abiraterone and comparing that to enzalutamide alone. This was done in the cooperative groups by Mike Morris. We hopefully will see whether this complete blockade is actually going to make any difference uh, compared to enzalutamide alone. So uh, we're learning the optimal time to give these agents. Remember, again, giving them earlier is where we, we're tending to move them. Uh, when do you stop them? Well, this is a problem we'll see from a, a graph coming up in a few moments that uh, you can still progress by PSA and not progress radiographically. And then in this particular patient, uh, this patient started on uh, enzalutamide and had a rapid decline in his PSA, and his PSA then began to drift up. And despite this, he was evaluated radiographically, and he, it took him uh, almost three years to, or actually almost four years, uh, to show a symptomatic bone progression. So PSA is not the only way you should treat or monitor these patients. You have to monitor scans, and I tend to keep these patients on for a longer period of time if their PSA is going up and their scans are also uh, stable. Uh, I mentioned before this issue about cross-resistance. There's a lower response rate when you sequence these agents. And the, the also the issue about giving steroids with, with enzalutamide and uh, this may be related to the glucocorticoid receptor. Uh, and in fact, if you look at multivariate analysis from the enzalutamide trials, patients on prednisone actually do worse than patients who are not on prednisone with enzalutamide. And again, I don't know if that's just retrospective data or if we, see some, if, if, if we did it prospectively, we would see it. Now, I mentioned the ARV7 before, and this is actually commercially available now. Uh, you can do a test for ARV7. And, um, uh, when you look at the full-length uh, androgen receptor uh, versus those who have uh, ARV7 in uh, uh, light brown or the positive ones in blue are the negative ones, we see here that you generally see a fair number of PSA responses in the blues, those who don't have the ARV7. Some do not respond even though they, they, they don't have ARV7, and there are secondary resistance mechanisms that may, uh, may cause that. Uh, but again, we see that for the most part, those that are positive don't respond to enzalutamide or abiraterone. And we also see a shorter time to progression with these patients. So this is the group that we may want to think about giving chemotherapy to, although again, we don't have prospective trials. Uh, chemotherapy in post Primary docetaxel is also active. Uh, cabazitaxel, which is a derivative of docetaxel, does have activity uh, in patients who fail primary chemotherapy. There's about a three-month improvement in median survival, and it's fairly well tolerated. Now, one may ask, well, if, if cabazitaxel is so active after docetaxel, what happens if you move it up front and compare it to docetaxel? Strangely, there's no difference. They're exactly the same in survival. The median overall survival is about two years with either agent. And even with the lower doses of cabazitaxel, which are generally less toxic, we see a survival of about 25 months. So to summarize, these are our agents available, cipulucil T, abiraterone, cabazitaxel. I'll talk a little bit about radium. Uh, but these are the ones that have survival benefits. And radium, we think about in terms of DNA repair. And this is, again, where we're going to be moving in the future. There, uh, these G mutations 
that, that cause DNA repair to be less effective than normal. These can lead to further gene mutations, so these, are, these can lead to aggressive tumors, and we are beginning to develop targeted therapies. If you look at prostate cancer in terms of some of these DNA repair enzymes, BRCA, ATM, CHECK2, they seem to occur in about 23% of castrate-resistant prostate cancers. 11.8% of the men have these mutations in the germline. The rest of these are somatic. And the age and the family history really don't affect uh, the frequency of these particular mutations. Now, this, we're talking about the repair of double-stranded DNA. And you attack this by looking at the repair of single-stranded DNA. And that's where these PARP inhibitors come into play they will affect the single-stranded repair pathway. So if you got this double block in DNA repair, you're going to cause cell death and apoptosis. So PARP is involved in multiple aspects of DNA repair and has activity in breast cancer. It has activity in ovarian cancer. And right now, there are five PARP inhibitors that are being evaluated in castrate-resistant prostate cancer. And the earliest that went to uh, evaluation was Olaparib. Olaparib was evaluated in a trial by Johan de Bono in Europe in the Toparp study, where he took patients who had mutations uh, as, well, as well as non-mutated patients and treated them uh, who had, these patients had failed prior docetaxel. They retrospectively went back and correlated the DNA repair mutations with response. So if you have BRCA or CHECK or any of the DNA repair mutations, 88% of these patients responded to Olaparib. If you didn't, it was only 6% of patients. And we see here there's a difference in the radiographic progression-free survival and the overall survival in favor of those patients who are biomarker positive. So this is now being confirmed in prospective randomized trials and was granted breakthrough approval by the FDA. So in conclusion, the rapid development uh, of multiple agents over the last five years has outpaced our ability to understand the optimal integration of, of these agents. Cross-resistance occurs, but how do we identify our patient is crucial and genomic profiling is expanding our options for targeted and personalized medicine.